All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. This is serverless Scala uh, functions as super duper microservices. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Pico services. P Pico nano. Nano services. Yeah. Something like or that. Or VI services. VI services. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm James Ward, a developer advocate on Google Cloud. Uh, and I'm uh, Josh Surrett. I'm an engineer at Google, uh, and I do stuff with Scala. Cool. So let's dive in. So I want to start talking about uh, serverless. What is serverless? Um, so my simple definition of what serverless is is that you pay for what you use, manage hosting. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll talk more about, pull that apart in just a second. But a few ways that you might have interacted with serverless is one through what's called function as a service. And this is where you deploy a function and it is serverless. So you only pay for it when it's being used and it's in a managed environment. So you don't have to deal with any infrastructure. And then the other place where you might uh, encounter serverless is uh, when you want to deploy not just a function, but an entire application. And this allows you to have multiple functions together, obviously, in a single package. So with serverless, when we say um, you pay for what you use, what that means is that there's usually like some way to charge based on number of requests or amount of processing time. So if... Um, you know, where there is multiple instances or, or multiple requests being handled by a single instance, then you may only have to pay for the CPU time that those requests are being handled and not double pay, um, that sort of thing. Um, so this means that if you're not using it, you don't pay. That's great. And then as you use it more, you pay more. And then managed means that you don't have to worry about uh, patching underlying operating systems or dealing with um, distributing an application across multiple servers and data centers and redundancy and restarting processes when they die, uh, that all that stuff is just managed for you and so that you don't have to think about it. Or like pre-allocating for spikes. If you expect a traffic spike at a particular time and you, you want to make sure you have enough server load, that's not your responsibility anymore. That's the responsibility of your provider. Yeah. Yeah. So in some ways, it's just a new buzzword for some things that have been around for a while. Um, but I think really the, the, the kind of new nugget is that around serverless is that the, scale, the idea of scaling to zero. So we've, we've had this, we've been trying to march towards utility computing, only paying for what we use. But it turned out that the, the um, granularity of that pay for what you use allowed us to have a lot of unused resources that we were paying for. And so with uh, serverless, not thinking about servers and instances, we really only pay for what we use and it can scale to zero. So oftentimes when we talk about serverless, we also talk about containers. And so this is like Docker containers or the new um, open container initiative. And so um, containers can be an important piece in this we're, we're going to be using today. So we'll give you just a brief overview of what containers are. Um, so essentially, they're zip files. Uh, and so uh, you take a zip file, uh, kind of a zip file, and you put some stuff into it. Uh, what you put into it is like a mini operating system. And there's lots and lots of different base operating systems that you can use for this. There's Alpine Linux is popular. You can use your standard Ubuntu. Uh, lots of different options there. So you put your like mini operating system into your container. And then you also put your application and any dependencies that it needs to run inside of that zip file as well. And then the container has a startup command so that then when something runs this container, it knows how to actually start the process that you want to start to start up your application. So that's, that's uh, the basics of a container. So at Google, uh, what we're going to be using today is something called Cloud Run, which is serverless for containers. So you take your containers and you uh, upload them to Google Cloud for Cloud Run, and then uh, we will run those serverlessly. So let me give you a quick little demonstration of that. So I have a, a repo here on GitHub, and this is about as simple as things could possibly get. So I'll show you the, the Docker file here. Um, what we do is we're going to start with the Alpine Linux uh, distribution base uh, image. And then our command that we're going to run to start our process uh, is actually using Netcat. And so this is actually, um, I think, about the shortest web server you could possibly write. Uh, so this is handling requests on port uh, whatever is defined by the 
the environment variable port, and then it's going to respond with hello world. So let's go launch this thing on Cloud Run. So I'm going to click this little button, and it's going to verify that, yes, I, in fact, do want to clone that GitHub repo, and I do want to deploy that on Cloud Run. So what it's going to do is it's going to walk through a few steps. It's going to run the Docker build on that, that uh, GitHub repo, which will assemble the Docker container. And it's going to ask me here in a second where, what project I want to use. So I'll just hit yes for my JW demo project. So now it's building the container, storing the container image up on the Google container uh, registry. And then it's going to use Cloud Run to deploy that application uh, up on the cloud. So it should just take a second here to deploy that service, and then we'll be able to go check it out. So let's go, Google, go cloud. How often do you wait on Google? Uh, uh, I mean, all the time. But I, I also wait on myself. That's usually I'm the bottleneck. But yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, all right, there we go. We're up and running. So now you'll see we got an HTTPS endpoint and services unavailable. Let's give it one more try. There we go. Hello, world. Uh, so we just took that, that container that we built, deployed it, and now it's running. And Google will scale this to as many requests as we want to throw at the thing. And so uh, it'll handle all those requests. And there we go. We're running up on the cloud. So that's our, our really basic uh, intro there to... Um, to Cloud Run and containers and serverless. Uh, Cloud Run is a managed service, so, uh, so we manage everything for you at Google. But if you want to do everything on your own, there's a project that, that Cloud Run is based on, an open source project called Knative, which gives you the same functionality on top of Kubernetes. So you don't have to use us. You can use Knative on your own. So I want to talk about cold starts real quick because this is something that comes up very quickly as you get into serverless. So what a, a cold start is, is it's really a problem of being able to scale down the resources. Typically what we do in computing is that we over-provision our resources, our servers, so that we can handle spikes in things. And as a service provider, or even if you're running your own stuff, you probably want to be able to throttle down those resources and not over-provision them, because if you're over-provisioning them, then you're not paying for what you use. You're paying for things beyond what you use. And so what happens with serverless is that things are scaled down so that you're only paying for them when you're using them, but then there's some amount of time that it takes to scale things back up, to start up uh, the processes, pull the containers out of the, the registry, start up the processes, warm those processes up. And so what happens is if a request comes in and it has to go through this startup process, then that's called a cold start, and, uh, and it can, can be a bad experience for users if they're sitting around waiting for uh, large applications to start up. So it's definitely a challenge in the, the serverless world. And one of the ways that we can deal with this, particularly with, uh, with the application that we built and with JVM applications, is to use Grawl. So Grawl, it does ahead of time compilation. So it takes our, our Scala application that we're going to show you, and it ahead of time compiles that down into a native image, which is much smaller and much faster to start up. Yeah, so you might be asking yourself, like, why am I doing ahead of time compilation if maybe, like, you know, we've been investing so much in the JIT, so much in this runtime optimization, so much, like, in the JVM and Java. But really, you need to think of it as a trade-off, right? I'm trading consistency in my RPC response latency in terms of startup time for these services and the throughput, right? I'm trying to trade consistency for optimal speed. So I might not be able to make this one server completely optimal, but I might be able to get a better throughput organization across the machines that I'm making use of under the covers by having more consistency. Um, it's easier to kind of understand load. It's easier to kind of understand um, how long it takes to bring one of these services up and handle you know, incoming traffic. So you're making that trade-off, and it's, it's not like a zero-sum game, right? So sometimes you want the JVM, sometimes you don't. And this is one of the things where serverless kind of lets you go the other way and kind of reap those benefits. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so that's, that's one way to um, work on addressing the cold start issues. 
Okay, so we've learned a bit about serverless, and now we're going to take a step to the other side and talk about building server apps. Uh, so um, I've done a lot of Play Framework development in, in my days, and uh, I love Play, Play Framework. It's a great framework. Um, and the, the way that you handle requests in Play is really simple. You create this action, which is really just a wrapper around a function that goes from a request to a response or a future of response. Um, so really nice API. Is that, is that supposed to be a covers? Those, those, are, those are Scala covers. Those are Scala covers. I mean, that's what I have on my bed at home. That's, that's what your yeah. covers all look right. like, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, but underneath those are all of these things that we're hiding, right? Yeah. So, so under there, I'm hiding access to my database. I'm hiding just the, the general serialization mechanism I use to go in and out of HTTP. Yeah. Uh, and all of that is actually kind of encoded in this function, and I'm actually locked to it to some extent. Yeah, it's in the class that you extend and comes in through injection. Um, but yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff that's actually needed to be able to handle a request. And it's, as, as you said, it's lurking under your covers. Like, it, it's not something that you see in the function definition. Um, so it can be uh, a little tricky sometimes to, to test these things, because they're functions that don't really work independently. They need all of that context around them in order to work. Yeah, and this is where you see it is when you start writing tests, right? When I write tests, I have to kind of stub out these functions. And for some of these applications, they have to give you the affordance, this hook, to be able to override that behavior in a test so that you can stub out some production service so I can run a local testable instance of it, right? I have this thing I'm talking to, like a database, but I don't really want to talk to a real database in my test, but I want to talk to something close enough that I can make sure I'm doing the right thing. You know, and how do I plug in a testable component and make that work, right? All, all these frameworks basically provide you an API. And then, oh, we have to do this security thing. Well, let me provide you an API to test that, you know? Yep. And you keep, you're constantly doing this battle. Yeah. Yeah, and it could be, uh, you can really bind your logic to the actual protocol that you're implementing um, in this way. So that's, that's one of the things that I found with, with Play. It's so easy, but uh, if, I, if my protocol changed or I wanted to implement a different protocol, I had to do a lot of refactoring in order to, to be able to support that. Okay, so... So the, the environment is effectively changing, though, as time goes on, right? Instead of deploying, like, servers or the old J2E model where I throw, like, a war somewhere and there's this big server that handles all these web applications, we're kind of moving back to a little bit of that of I throw these functions out at the cloud and run those or I have this big Kubernetes cluster and I spin up a whole bunch of instances on one machine. Um, but we're not in a write-once-run-anywhere um, in the sense of, like, existential. Uh, we're in a write once, run everywhere, right? So not only do I need to run my um, application like on the cloud, I need to run it on my internal servers, I need to run it in dev, I need to run it in prod, I have a microservice architecture, so I make a change to something here, and then I need to check that downstream works, but I need to find a way to run my service and its dependencies with my service changed, and then make sure all of the other production things that talk to it don't break, right? And so I might make a staging instance of this. I might find ways to piecemeal, you know, redo my graph. I'm actually running this block of code in many, many, many places, not just a single place, right? Um, so it's about understanding and adapting to your environment more so than just being able to run on any environment. Yeah. War, wara to war. War, war. Oh, no. <laughs> No, 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 not war. That's right. How, do you, how would you say that? We don't war, want to pronounce that word. Yeah, yeah, that's a bad one. Maybe I'll come up with another one. Uh, okay. Um, so anyway, the, the, we want to make migrating code really, really, really simple. So the idea is when you're at a particular application level, you need to focus on the logic appropriate to that level or the thing that you're doing. So if I am in development of a feature... I should be focusing on the business logic of my feature. If I am worried about the production environment that I'm within, I'm dealing with like latency, I'm dealing with load, I'm dealing with my 99th percentile latency, which is always fun. I, that's my favorite problem right now. P99. Um, P99, it's yeah. Hotness. Uh, so if, I, if I'm dealing with like those one, that one request that's slow where all the rest of them are fine, right? I want to be thinking about concurrency. I want to be thinking about, you know, all of the different monitoring and, and over, you know, um, um, tracing that I need to figure this stuff out. That's what I'm in my production layer. And that's what I want to be talking that language. But when I'm doing my features, I don't want to be speaking that language in code. That's not my intent when I write that code. So we want to kind of divorce these things. 
And then when I'm testing, it's all about what's coming in and what's going out, right? A am, I, am I abiding by these protocols that I'm telling other people I do? So I want to be able to have those focuses. Yeah. And can we test the protocol in different, as it would be implemented in different environments? Exactly. So, okay. yeah. So we have an example that we built uh, for this presentation using chatbots. And so I want to show you just a little bit of that, and then at the end we'll, we'll see the whole thing. Um, so just a little bit of background uh, on our chatbot is we wanted to illustrate different environments by providing different protocols that our chatbot can talk through. So we've got a protocol for standard in and standard out, Telnet, and then HTTP post coming from Google Cloud for a Google action, um, which gives us some state, and then we return some speech back. So the logic that we want to program to is really just the things we want to say and the questions we want to ask and, and receiving the answers back. So that's our, our little chatbot, and I'm going to show you the standard in, standard out version of it. So this is all uh, running locally here. So you see this is just standard, standard in, standard out. Wait, let's the, yeah. the audience, what, what would you say is your favorite oh, programming yeah. language? What is your best, what's the best programming language? Best, not favorite. Well, I, I heard Python. Python? All right, let's write Python. Oh, wrong. Wrong. I'm sorry. Wrong. Try again. Java. Java. Okay. Java. Wrong. Nope. Nope. Scala? Scala. Correct. Oh, yay. We got to leave. <laughs> All right. Okay. So there's our very, very simple chatbot running on standard in, standard out. Um, so the protocol that we're using here is standard in and standard out, but the logic that you'll see in, in just a little bit is really just describing the conversation. It's not describing, not hooked into the protocol. Okay, so that's our basic chatbot. Oh, reload. <laughs> it's the worst key sequence ever. Okay, there we go. All right. Right, so in pseudocode, the way this looks is you say, uh, when I get something that the user has spoken to me, right, in, in, via, via typing or talking, we're actually, we have a Google Home here, so we're going we're gonna to do that yeah. in a bit. Um, if the user has talked to me, uh, I need to figure out what they said, and then, you know, do something based on what they said. So in, in this case, if they say that they like Scala, of course they're correct. But if they say any other language, no, yeah, sorry, that was wrong. And then... Um, in all other instances, and we made a really fun syntax here for uh, underscore. This is the most um, beautiful skull I've ever seen. We, you, you do not know how long we spent on this slide just for the underscores. But anyway. Um, you have to pick words precisely so you get the right, the right padding, you know, so you're not off by one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's tricky. We're going to ask you what, what's the best language. So, so the idea here is uh, the, the speech is done through some sort of like text to intent recognizer, and that's a module that's going to run. And this code is just running after that particular module. Okay. How'd you color that text? Uh, I used the machine learning, uh, <laughs> but applied to myself. Oh, it's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, you yeah. did a great job with that. The colors match perfectly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so what's the problem with this? I, it, it said it returned, let's see, can we get back to it? Unit. Yeah. So, hmm, but, what is wrong with that? So what's wrong with this is the, the, the say method, right, and that ask method are tied to a particular implementation of say and ask, right, and I can't change it. So if I move this code somewhere else, those say and ask have to deal with all the complexity of figuring out how to implement themselves on all these different environments, and sometimes that, that's not realistic, yeah. right? Yeah, and so these are effects, right? These are, we, we have in this code uh, effects that are happening. So it's things that are affecting something somewhere else. And so that makes it, so we've now tied ourselves to a particular protocol, a particular environment. So how did we solve this in the past? Does anyone remember like old school C++, C, when we had multiple architectures? We had to write code and we wanted to compile for this CPU and that CPU. What do you do? What? Yeah, it, you, you, would, you would virtualize, right? You'd like create, a, create an API that was, you know, you would interpret. Like the, uh, you'd have, you'd have an, a thing which abstracts out the environment you're going to run in, and you would develop against that. And there'd be different implementations. And yes, they were done with pound defines and, and, and if defs. But the idea was I had the same API depending on what environment I'm on. And there's a pattern for that in the, OO. The interpreter pattern. Is it an OO? Yeah, it was, it was, First started in it was an OO. This yeah. is the functional version of it, which I think is the more elegant version of it. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, 
<laughs> anyway, so, so here, you know, that you can see, this is, this is, this is not dotty, but man, I, I want to make this be in the new. Um, that we have a sealed trait hierarchy. It's just an ADT of like the user can say something, they can ask something, or they can have an output, which is some combination of telling people things and asking them questions at the same time, right? I don't know why you'd ask two questions at the same time, but you might. So <laughs> I've done it in conversation. Um, like how? Like when? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, okay, so then uh, we, ha we have our implementation which returns this, this, this stage program to operate. You know, and this, is, this allows us to have this meta program. This is something that you've probably heard a bajillion times in the Scala community. And if this is the first time you're hearing it, um, you will hear this a bajillion times in, the, in your future in the Scala community. Yep. Yeah, so we're, what we're doing is we're separating out the effects from the interpreter. We are um, just describing what our program should do instead of actually have our program do something. And then the interpreter is what comes along and actually does something. Now, Scala has had a very, very long history in trying to figure out how to do this correct. Okay? Um, in 2012, there was this, like, free monad thing that Scala was experimenting with that had come from, you know, Haskell and some other things. And then in 2015, there was a paper on the freer monad, um, very appropriately named to be, you know, slightly better than the free monad because it's even more free. Um, it, it turns out, if you looked in the details, the freer monad is the free monad, just the first encoding wasn't, you know... 100%. Anyway, uh, then in 2017, we had this thing called tagless final, which is, hey, this is faster than the freer monad for doing the interpreter pattern and even better. And in 2018, we have this thing called ZIO coming in, which is, hey, here's another way of doing it that's even better. So, so we're just going to throw out there. Yeah, let's look into our cr uh, crystal ball and yeah. see what's out there. We, we are making a prediction that by the time we have colonized Mars, we'll have a way of doing interpreters that is the standard way. Or slightly after that. Just a little bit after, yeah. yeah. Sometime around then. Yeah. Sometime around then. Yeah. Um, for this talk, we're going to be covering ZIO. It's the latest one. Um, it has, there's pros and cons. Um, I do want to say, if you look at the website, it has a bunch of marketing, which we don't appreciate. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's, a, you know, there's some divisive things about maybe a lot of segments of the Scholar community, and, and ZIO includes that. Yeah. But, um, so we just wanted to use it to give it a try. Um, no specific endorsement. Uh, yeah, but, but it, it, has, it has an interesting take, which is slightly different from Tagless Final, and I think is, is uh, worth looking at, um, on the interpreter pattern. But this talk applies to any use of the interpreter pattern, not just to ZIO use, just, just so you know. It's, uh, yeah, I, I still think the Scala community is figuring out the right, uh, the right API here, and you've seen churn because nothing has really hit the mark yet, and uh, this one has potential. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just a quick little overview into Zio and what it looks like. So in Zio, what we do is we create programs as values. So that's um, where we uh, wrap our effects into uh, this Zio. And there's three different aspects to Zio. There's um, the, first, uh, the first type parameter is the environment type. So this is all of the, the resources uh, that our Zio, this particular instance of a Zio, needs to actually be able to do something. Um, so what we do is we, with our interpreter, we provide the implementations of the interpreter uh, that are going to go in and, and be used in the environment to then execute, actually execute that thing. So when it executes, uh, when a particular Zio executes, it can either return an error, and so we have a type parameter there for the error type, uh, or it can return a result, and so we parameterize the, the result type as well. And there's a great blog that goes into more details on uh, what it's called like bifunctor IO, um, kind of this pattern for this. But what you can think about it is that the environment uh, provides the ability to, to return an either error or result. So that's the basic structure of Zio, and there's a lot of convenience functions for how to assemble and link together Zios and create the, that meta program uh, that then will be executed by the interpreter. So this is how we would abstract the environment for how we talk. So um, in, in, there's, there's a few interesting parts here that we have to call out um, that will allow you to kind of uh, wiggle around your environment as you write a program. So here we create a talk service. A talk service is a single value that implements a trait. And the trait is your API. This is the thing that you used to call that looks like it mutates, right? So I have a service that has say and prompt in it that takes in a message, just like I had in my mutable interface, all right? And it's going to return something wrapped in ZIO. 
Um, and I'm going to define this trait talk service, which is my environment. This, this describes, um, in, in my application, anytime I see something that takes a talk service as an environment, it means I have to provide an implementation of this API to run that code. Um, and then I have this convenience method down here where that's what users of talk service will do. And so the way that code reads is basically I have a talk service where anytime someone calls say, it's going to look up the implementation and actually run it. All right? And so this is, this is boilerplate. This is what I would say is possibly the, the ugly gunk of, of ZIO. Yeah. Um, it's, it's kind of like a, a thing you have to do to um, then get the better APIs on the other side. Um, and if you've ever done, you know, interpreter abstractions, you kind of have this somewhere. I haven't seen one that fully gets rid of this stuff, but uh, yeah, this is this is what it looks like for ZIO. Maybe Scala three will fix it for us. Yes, <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah. Um, all right. So then, when I when I write that that previous method that takes the uh, user speech and decides what to do, it looks very similar now, right? Um, the the cool thing is because of some type inference and the the way these things return. Um, that ZIO takes a talk service as its environment. It's telling me when I read this, oh, I need to provide an implementation of talk service to be able to test this function. It's in the type system, so I can't forget to provide it when I write a test. I need to make sure that I've provided it or I can't run this function. Um, but everything is kind of staged. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed a bug on our slide. You see it? Uh, the last one. The last Say, one. It's supposed to be ask. Oh, it is ask. Yeah. There's oh. a bug on the slide. Buggy that's, slides. That's my Who fault. tested these things? Right. Anyway, just, just reinforcing that like talk service is called out. It's in the type system. I need this thing. Okay. So when I want to provide an environment um, and I want to run the same application, right, I can call next with user intent and it's going to give me a staged program that hasn't run yet. So I can decide to provide the service that will work on the cloud, or I can provide the service that works on the console. And this is actually, if you look at our demo code, which we'll show later, um, or give you the link later, you can see um, the console application and the cloud application are the exact same implementation. And we're just providing different services, environments for them. And so that's where we implement the different protocols that are going to be used. So we have uh, a protocol for Telnet, one for the web server, uh, which we wrote our own web server for this, which was super yeah, fun. Yeah, that, yeah. I don't recommend it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, so that's, that's how we then abstract away the, the meta program from the interpreter. Yeah. Uh, right. The other cool thing is, if I make use of other services and other APIs, the reason you had that trait with that val is these, these environments can compose with OO, right? Um, we, we have this notion of um, it's, it's kind of Scala 2's version of union type, and it's a way better in Scala 3. But I can basically have all of these traits composed together. And so if I have an API that requires a talk service, and I'm using my monitoring API, then that program will require a talk service with monitoring and will just work. Right? So I can actually um, compose these APIs and limit the type of any program to just the services it makes use of. And if I start to see my cake explode real big, maybe that's a sign to me to refactor. Right? So you have this natural um, way of, of viewing your, your program and kind of limiting the amount of environment you require in any one function. Awesome. Okay, uh, so here's an example where we throw in monitoring. We have a monitoring service, and so uh, we define a monitoring service that allows us to monitor what language people vote for when they don't choose Scala. So we can figure out why we don't recognize other languages and whether we should add them to our language recognition or ignore them. I don't yeah. know. One of the two. And so to do this, all, we didn't change the, the actual effects here. We just changed the, the meta program. Uh, added in monitoring, so there was no impact on, on anything. And then we just had to add that monitoring trait into our environment to make this work. Yeah, so the, the signature changed to require talk service with monitoring instead of just talk service. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so so what? <laughs> why, why have we been talking about ZO and effects and interpreters? And where I think this gets really interesting is that what we can do is we can abstract away from our environment. That's what the effects and interpreter separation allows us. And then with serverless, we can abstract away from our operations. And then what we get is a beautiful baked cake in the cloud. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> Bake our cake in the cloud. Yeah. And so the, those two uh, allow us to have an application that is, that is portable across environments and then uh, don't have to think about the operational side when it's running in the cloud. So nice combination there of things. So for uh, this particular application, the way that we set it up was that in our dev interpreter, the one you saw earlier, we used standard in, standard out for our, for our protocol interpreter. For our test interpreter, we actually used a mutable console. And so this allows us then to assert on the, the values that have been uh, inserted in, so the statements that have been inserted in, and feed in different um, inputs and that sort of thing. And then in the prod interpreter, uh, we have the web server and stack driver for, for monitoring. Yeah, and the beauty, the beauty, like the reason, the reason we did this and, and have this demonstration that's nice and simple was to show you, you know, your, your dev iteration cycle environment, if that thing remains prod, it becomes a problem over time, right? Like when I have to actually go to prod and push things in prod and test in prod and test against prod instances and kind of replace microservices, this actually can cause a lot of developer friction. It can cause a lot of slowdown in your iteration cycle. And you want to try as best as you can to find ways around that. Yep. Yeah. And we think this is a good way. OK, so let's see a demo here. So I'm going to start with. Um, Go up here to this one. Uh, so what we've done is create an action on Google. And maybe you can give a little overview on actions on Google, because yeah. I built one, but I don't really understand it. <laughs> so uh, this is, this is uh, part of the Google Assistant um, uh, it, and can do more. But the idea behind an action on Google is you have some task you want users to do, and you have to collect data. So you define, like, oh, the user has to give me, in this case, what their favorite language is, or you know, they have to say a time of day. And you collect all these pieces of data, and then it's going to make a webhook endpoint call to you. And you have to take that data that came in, figure out how to fulfill what the user wants, and then tell them what you say back. Right? Um, it's, yep. it's a relatively simple, simple API. Cool. So for an action on Google, we have an invocation, and we give it a name. So this one is Scala Zio. And then we have an action. And we've used something uh, called dialogue flow to actually define our action. And so with dialogue flow, we define an intent. So the first, uh, we've created one that handles a welcome event. And then there's a parameter called language. And so that's all um, we had to set up in the intent. You'll see that we are telling it to call it to a webhook. And so if we go to Fulfillment, you'll see that here's my app running up on Cloud Run with our Zio application. And that's what's actually going to get those requests. So when the welcome event happens, it's going to make a request. When the user answers, it's going to make a request, that sort of thing. OK, so that's, uh, that's our intent and our action. Um, anything do, else do on you, that? Do you have the simulator open? I just want to show this. this oh, yeah. Is, this is another thing. So on the simulator, you can actually hit your live webhook, right? But again, it's your live webhook. So if you're testing <laughs> and you replace that webhook with something else and you accidentally have that be public, uh-oh, uh -oh. I just broke the whole world, right? Yeah. Yeah, so what often happens when people are doing local dev on this type of webhook is they use something like ngrok to expo expose their local machine to the internet so that then Google can make a call to that thing, which then routes to their development machine. And that's a process that we're trying to move away from and that we think uh, effects and interpreters um, can help with. OK, so let's just take a look at a little bit of code here. Uh, so here is our um, kind of our main application. Let me actually start a little bit higher where we can see our um, traits here. So we have a survey intent, which can be start the survey, give us a language choice, end the survey, uh, survey state, init question or done. And then what we're doing is we're building up a Zio um, that, that essentially knows how to handle an incoming intent and then produce uh, the survey state out of that. So you can see what, what it returns out is that survey state. Um, so input, survey intent, output, survey state. You'll see that we're using uh, Zio, so we give it the environment that it needs, and that includes the monitoring, that includes the um, console, which provides the protocol, uh, and then we can throw an IO exception. What, one thing you'll notice, this looks different than the slides we showed before, and the primary reason is this first thing of handle language, where if you said acceptable language, we're going to say correct, and if you didn't say acceptable language, we'll say wrong, and we'll reprompt you to say, hey, 
what was the best language, right? If you, you saw that in the, the console application. So this, this was a little bit more code than would fit on a slide, but that's, that's effectively what you're seeing here. Yep. Yeah, so, so this is just uh, us kind of putting together Zeos. So we're linking together different Zeos together to create the kind of outer Zeo. And at any Zeo level, we can, we can test that thing. We can provide it the environment that it needs, and we can actually test it with a unit test or uh, on a, in a dev instance or, or however we want to test that. So let me show you the actual unit test that we wrote for some of this. So you can see in this one, we're saying like the conversation must reject non-Scala languages. And so we um, just call that, that method to get our Zio. We provide it the environment that it needs. And then we do this unsafe run on that. So um, result here is a Zio of clock IO exceptions uh, survey state. And so we actually run that with the interpreter um, that we've provided it. And then uh, we make sure that what we get back is a question, which is the state that we should get back with the wrong answer. Yeah. And if you look further down, uh, is it middle? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, if you look further down, um, we actually check monitoring, where we have an implementation monitoring that all it does is record all the calls that have been made into monitoring. And here we can assert that when you said C sharp, uh, we make sure that the recorder also recorded C sharp to make sure that our monitoring calls are in the right place. Yeah. Um, so if, if we were to show up higher in the file, you'd see where we have the, the mutable part of the environment that allows us to store those things in the test environment. Yeah. Um, but we would never yeah. want to do it that way in production. Y you can imagine that this is, uh, given how trivial our business logic is, it doesn't, it's not as impressive, but when you actually do one of these dialogues for real, you end up with a lot more complicated logic, and so making sure that you log something in this little tiny instance is a lot harder and more important to verify. Yeah. yeah, what's nice is that we can, we can test the Zeos at any level of Zeos. Like, because they're just the Zeos, we can, we can combine them together, chain them together, but then we can also test them at any point as well, any yeah. point that we expose from our application. Yep. That's nice. Okay, so let me show you the Docker file that is used to uh, use Grawl to uh, create the application, um, the native image part of this application. So I'm using the Grawl VMCE image and then um, running this install for native image, which is the tool to do the ahead of time compilation. And then SBT Native Packager, thanks Josh and many others, uh, has... Like pretty much everyone else now. <laughs> That's right, you're, you're long gone. Um, so Grawl VM Native Image is a task uh, provided by the Native Packager, which is going to run Grawl and, uh, and then do the process to create that, that uh, ahead of time compiled image. So that's how we build our artifact, our application, our native application. So then to, to actually run it, we're going to use the Alpine Linux image. And then we're going to copy the app that was compiled from SPT and Grawl. And then here's the command that we use to start it up. So the nice thing here is this is taking uh, our application and running it in Grawl, and we can actually define this as our cloud run. We can have this be like a production deployment. But again, if we wanted to have a non-Grawl image and have a non-Grawl way of, of starting this for development that has a faster iteration cycle, you just make a different Docker file for that thing, and you build it in that way, right? Like, yeah. you should be able to have different environments. This is production, this is the native, this is the fast restart, this is the one where I want, you know, uh, to know exactly what my latency is, but that doesn't mean this is good for your developer, right? Uh, how long did it take us to build this Grail image? And this is like a very, very small program. It's like seven minutes. Seven uh, minutes, yeah. right? That's great for pushing to prod. That's a beautiful push to prod. That is not a good dev iteration cycle time. Right? I don't want to growl things for dev iteration cycles. Yep. Yeah, so with Zio, we need to have some point where we kind of bake the cake. And the way that we've done that is we've used command flags, uh, command args, to do that. And so when you specify dash web, that's going to assemble the web server into the environment, uh, put the web server um, protocol provider into that environment so that then we can handle web requests versus handling you doing it through standard in, standard out, or um, the telnet server. Yeah. And so, you know, there's also dash telnet, and I think nothing means nothing. console. Yeah, it's console. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we um, have already deployed this application up on the cloud, so that's, um, if we want to go check that out, we'll go see it here in the Cloud Run console. So here it is, our Zio Lang survey. So you'll see there's our endpoint, and we can check out the logs and see revisions and that sort of thing, and 
throwing some errors there at some point, <laughs> um, but that's okay. Uh, okay, so, th so our application is now, we've gone through the process of creating the Docker image and deploying that on Cloud Run. So now we should be able to actually talk to it from our um, Google, what do you call this thing? Google Home? This is uh, a Google Go Home Mini. Google Home Mini, yeah, oh, right. Yeah. Or is it a micro? I mean, no one can see it here. Oh yeah, we should probably lift it up and show them. Okay, so let's, let's give it a try and see if it actually works. Hey Google. Talk to Scala Zio. Okay, here's the test version of Scala Zio. Survey says, what is the best programming language? Scala. Correct. Yay. All right. First <laughs> so, time. First time. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Wow. Good, good job on that. Yeah. 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 Nice. Right. So anyway, so that's, that's our little application. Okay, let's hop back to the slides. And let's check them out. Okay, so you saw the demo of putting all those different things together. We didn't show the Telnet environment, but you did get to see the standard in, standard out, and the, uh, the test, the unit test, and then the web server environment. So, so the concept we really, really, really want to emphasize here is like the idea of making things portable through staging and understanding that my production environment and my dev iteration cycle environment and my test environment are different. And any time I write a program, I actually have more than one environment target, no matter what. Like, even if I only have one production environment, I'm still targeting many different environments for the life cycle of this project. Right, well, write once, run everywhere, right? Like, more than one place for the life cycle of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's the future. It's the future. Yeah. And we do expect, you know, these tools and things will get better over time. This is just a... Yeah, what we think is pretty cool right now. Yeah. Yeah. Ship your meta program, right? Yeah. 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 And staging, you know, that's going to make it better. Definitely. Cool. All right. So all the code is up on my GitHub there, Zio Lang survey uh, on James Ward on GitHub. And uh, Josh did most of the work, so thank you <laughs> <Yeah>. for that. <laughs> so even though it's on my GitHub, I'm taking all the credit, but Josh yeah. actually did all the work. So. Yeah. Uh, that's not true. Anyway. Okay. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah. A couple minutes for questions. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Let's see. How should people ask questions? We have, we have floating mics, so just raise your hand if you have a question. It's a big room. Don't be shy. We'll also be around afterwards if anybody has any questions. Hey. Any? Okay. It was, it was flawless. It was, yeah, five. perfect, yeah. perfect. Okay. All right, well, thank you all so Thanks, much for coming. Everybody. We'll be actually, around if you have questions. Thanks. All right. We actually, we oh. actually have a question. Oh, you oh, we do? Have a sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, yes. We, we can't see with some of the yeah. lights. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Isn't there a specific uh, scenario when the interpreter is uh, uh, able to crash the application? So, I mean, um, let's assume that... Um, the application runs perfectly in the test time environment, but uh, with a different uh, interpreter, it breaks. Yeah, so th that's a great question. Um, th that, that does happen. And the idea, one of the, one of the things you're trying to do is uh, the person who writes the interpreter might not be the same person who writes the business logic. And the people who can debug in production bugs might not be the same people who are efficient at writing domain code. And so this allows you to kind of specialize where someone kind of owns the uh, interpreter for production and they work on those bugs and they specialize on those bugs and they are more efficient at those bugs um, than, than your entire team having to deal with them at the same time, right? It's, it's, it's a specialization trade-off. Now, if your team is small enough, it might just be you are the domain logic and the interpreter and this other thing, but it lets you divide your own time in the same way. Um, and it's up to you whether or not you think that's, you know, useful. But uh, especially as teams get bigger, uh, we find that there tends to be specialized, you know, uh, persons. And so dealing with production tends to be certain people deal with certain production components. So the, the better we can tune those bugs to that person and optimize their work, the, the better off we are. As opposed to forcing everyone to learn that, even people who never will. Uh, and yeah. Even. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. to add on to that, in this example, we actually uh, had a situation where a request was coming in that wasn't able to be parsed, and so it was actually crashing our server because there was an exception that was not being handled correctly. And so that was, I looked at the, the logs and was like, luckily the, 
the application was being restarted, so I didn't have to think about that. But then I was able to go look at the logs and be like, oh, there's an exception that, that actually made it all the way out and uh, crashed my process and my, you know, bug on me. Yep, I should have handled that. And that was in the interpreter was where that actually was. So. Yeah, what's interesting for this application, uh, so I implemented the console version and James implemented the cloud version and independently. Like, we didn't even really have to look at each other's code. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I copied your telnet code. Oh, it's, it's fine. Yeah, don't it's tell fine. anybody. I copied it from somewhere else. <laughs> okay. It's called Stack Overflow. <laughs> Stack Overflow. Shh. Don't All right. Uh, we are out of time, so thank you so much. Oh, one more question? Oh, sorry. One yeah. more. Oh, we keep giving you false, false ends. Yeah. <laughs> one more question. Sorry, just a quick one. Um, I saw you mention, I saw you showing Google Cloud, uh, but the supporting of Scala throughout Google Cloud services? Is it uh, better or is it because I used App Engine and I saw that the support is more for Java. Yeah. I saw some libraries around Scala, but I, I wasn't sure yeah. if there's a direct support towards the language itself. Yeah, I, there, there isn't direct support. Uh, what we're, because we're using Cloud Run, you can run anything that runs in a Docker container, essentially. And so, so there isn't specific support. But in the case of Cloud Run, we don't actually need any specific support. Um, that's definitely one reason why you choose Cloud Run over Google App Engine, is that you can run anything with Cloud Run. Yeah, OK, and, so but you would recommend Cloud Run over App Engine in general also, or is is the, more on the use there, there are some limitations with Cloud Run today. Like, for instance, it doesn't support WebSockets yet, which has been a bummer for some things that I've worked on. Um, and uh, Google App Engine just added WebSocket support. And so, um, so there are some variations in what you can do between the two. But for me, I'd like to just deploy a Docker container. Um, and I like that it's based on uh, Knative so that I can you know, port out of that environment if I need to and do it on my own Kubernetes. So, so for me, Cloud Run is kind of the default choice for execution. Um, but, but there are some limitations yeah, with it. Yeah, think, think about it this way. Uh, if most of your applications and most of your microservices are very simple, uh, Knative and Cloud Run give you a really good way to, to bootstrap and kickstart. Uh, if you get more complicated, you have to pick something a little more complicated. Uh, but that can they should be able to handle a lot, like just those two things. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll really be done this time. We'll be around if there's any other questions. Thank you. Thank you.